Anin Bienvenue and welcome everybody to our webinar on leading climate action during a pandemic. My name is Farah Wadia and as Hillary mentioned earlier, I'm a member of the webinar team and a grade seven, eight teacher in the TDSB. I'm very happy to welcome you today and would like to thank all of you for taking the time out of your busy schedules to join us in this learning series offered by the Toronto District School Board and OISI, the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education at the University of Toronto. I'd like to extend a warm welcome to Hilary Inwood, Lead of Environmental and Sustainability Education at OISI, as well as other members of the ESE team. Welcome also to the Toronto District School Board's Eco Schools and Sustainability Office team. They partner with OISI with so many of these incredible events. Welcome to Pam Miller, our instructional leader for Eco Schools. Linda Nacarado, who is one of our guest speakers today along with Pam, as well as um, Richard Christie, who will hopefully be joining us later today. He's the Senior Manager of the Sustainability Office at the TDSB. Thank you all for being here. It's wonderful to see so many of you uh, attending today. And again, if you're just entering the room now, please make sure to take the entry poll that you see on the screen, just to let us know a little bit more of your, about yourself. We will begin today's session on leading climate action during a pandemic with a land acknowledgement, followed by some information about a very exciting conference that's coming up in just about a week and a half's time uh, before we hear from our wonderful guest speakers, Pam Miller, the representatives from the Earl Hague Eco Council and Linda Nacarado. I'll tell you more about our speakers as we get underway, but I am just gonna say that they're incredibly inspiring and I really look forward to hearing what they have to say. Following our guest speakers, we were just going to share some information about upcoming webinars before we wrap up the session. So we've been featuring the artwork of indigenous artists along with the land acknowledgement at the start of our webinar series. Today, we'd like to feature the beautiful work of Ruth Cuthand. Ruth Cuthand was born in Saskatchewan of Plains Cree, Scottish and Irish ancestry, and grew up near the Blood Reserve. Her early fascination with disease, First Nations living conditions, and settler native relationships, informed by childhood experiences, have become the key elements in her creative practice, which has encompassed printmaking, painting, drawing, photography, and beadwork, like the image you see here, titled Smallpox, one of 12 images as part of her trading series, which depicts the viruses brought in by the Euro Europeans. Adopting traditional craft of beading in her recent work is a way to continue to center the Aboriginal woman in her art while addressing other issues of concern challenging mainstream perspectives on colonialism, the relationships between settlers and natives, the frictions between cultures and exposing the inequities that have plagued for centuries Canada's relationship with its first peoples. We acknowledge that we are hosted on the lands of the Mississaugas of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Wendat. We also recognize the enduring presence of all First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples. This is the TDSB's land acknowledgement, but we recognize that this is just a starting point for all of us. We know that land acknowledgements are not enough on its own and that there's a lot of work to be done. This is just a reminder that we have to enact and take action towards decolonization and reconciliation. So before we hear from our wonderful speakers, I'd just like to take a quick minute to share an incredible opportunity with all of you. The Climate Courage, Educators Addressing the Climate Crisis Conference is coming up on Saturday, November 6th from 9 to 12.30. And it's just basically a week from the Saturday. It's free online conference for TDSB staff and the OISE community. Dr. Sarah Ray from Humboldt State University in California will be the keynote speaker for the event which is designed for K to 12 educators. So please do register on Eventbrite, search for Climate Courage Conference and uh, do sign up. It's an opportunity that you don't want to miss. So with that said, it's my pleasure to welcome our first guest speaker for today, 
We have Pam Miller, Instructional Leader for TDSB Eco Schools, who will be presenting on behalf of Soraya Fabro. Pam? Thanks, Farah. I got a call from Soraya today. Uh, she was hit in the back of her head by a soccer ball and is now suffering um, concussion symptoms. Uh, she's fine now, but in terms of she does need to rest. And um, so I was able to um, get glean from her some of her wisdom and I will share that on her behalf. Um, so it, this is not my own, um, but hopefully uh, we can all learn from Soraya's great work. So let me just share my screen, oh, one second. Okay, just checking, uh, thumbs up from Hillary or Farah. Can you see that okay? Awesome, great. Um, so Soraya, I actually met, believe it or not, 19 years ago. I was working um, in Warren Park uh, in the Outdoor Education Centre and Soraya was a brand new teacher at Warren Park. She was the French teacher, she had a cart, she was wandering from class to class, as many of you know, uh, itinerant French teachers do. And she has become a rock star uh, in my world. She's my uh, she's an environmental specialist. She has gone through part one, part two, and part three in the OISE additional qualification courses. And so she's taught for 19 years um, throughout the elementary panel. And last year, as many of us did, she taught in the virtual school. Uh, she was in LC3. She was in the schools just for the grade two, threes, and fours. Um, and she taught uh, th grade three, 21 students. So when I asked her about her, uh, why she decided to do a, um, an eco club, uh, she said, well, she was familiar with teaching grade three through her previous experiences. So that wasn't, I mean, although virtual school was still a learning curve, she really wanted to run an eco club uh, because the environment was her passion. And she also wanted kids to be involved in concrete actions that would really help change their future. She knew at that point that Eco Schools Canada was open to virtual eco clubs. And when she had checked into about the requirement, she realized that it was definitely doable. Um, do, in, do the actions, fill out the form and get acknowledged. In the virtual uh, school at that point, there were 250 staff and 20,000 kids uh, in that, that school, which was crazy. Uh, so first thing she did, she realized she needed help. Uh, so she reached out to the 250 teachers and two teachers volunteered with her. Unfortunately, one of the teachers had to go. So her and Michelle uh, Marchiori, uh, who was also a grade four virtual teacher, joined in and launched the Eco Club. It was important for her to have that extra hand. Um, what they did here is you saw a letter. Uh, so she drafted a letter and she sent that out to the entire 20,000 kids <laughs> and she invited them all to be part of the eco team. Yes, a little bit crazy. Um, so this is what the form looked like. Um, the It was a parent permission form. So the principals in the LC4 helped out by sending it to each of the teachers that each of the teachers sent it to the grades two, threes and fours. And within a day, she had 124 responses. She said it was as quick, it was incredible. And she was able to take the, um, she, they had decided initially it would be first come, first serve, but they also wanted to make sure there was diversity in the grades two, three, and four. They ended up with 48 students between the two teachers. Um, and then they decided to have meetings at once every two weeks. So the other part of the form I thought was important uh, to show you is she said, although discipline wasn't an issue really in the virtual class, as many of us experienced, she thought it would be important to kind of lay out the ground rules right from the beginning. And she's repeated that this year so that it's really clear what to expect, both uh, how to hold yourselves, how to be a part of the virtual experience. So everybody knows. And the parents knew right off the bat as they were the ones giving their child permission. And there's the uh, equal member rules. Uh, so complete your responsibilities with care and pride. I really love that. Um, then she set up a Google Classroom. And again, that was really important because 
as you know, um, I know I forget so much. What's the Zoom link? Where it is? What's going on? When is the meeting? And so this allowed for constant communication with the students and the parents. And again, as the students logged in and somebody, you know, was connecting with them, they could go to the Google Classroom, know what meeting it was, know what was required, and of course that the l link. Um, it was also a great way for the parents to know what was going on and because she had different actions for each group, they also got examples for the actions, they got deadlines and so she really ran it in an organized way and she said without that sort of Google Classroom connection it probably wouldn't have been as uh, as possible. Whoops, there it is. So I keep on forgetting, changing two slides at the same time. So yeah, and the meeting minutes, what was accomplished. So if you missed the meeting, um, you, you know what was going on. All right, just switching slides again. Okay, so I asked her to tell me a little bit more about what the meeting looked like. Because I know this year, whether you run a virtual meeting, you've got some challenges or not. You've got some challenges, uh, either you're doing it outside or you're doing it virtually. And as the weather gets colder, you might move to that virtual meeting. So what might an agenda look like for you? She said school ended for them at 3.30. They started the meeting at 3.35 and ended at 4.15. In the first meeting, they picked the action. So what she did is they, her and Michelle went to Eco Schools Canada, looked through all the action cards and figured out which actions were doable and especially doable for that particular grade level because grade two, three, and four, you know, they want, you wanted to have that sense of accomplishment. You wanted something that had the materials and you wanted to be equitable with giving everybody an opportunity to participate. Once they figured out that, then uh, meetings would start and they started with attendance and one person was staffing all the Zoom requirements. And if, you, if nothing else, you do need those two people, she said, to let people in, to take the attendance, to do all those organizing bits. Um, for sure, they moved to an icebreaker, and I love that, connecting before content, uh, things like environmental bingo or different uh, different games, because the kids were from all over Scarborough uh, in their LC4, and they really wanted to make sure they built community before they were moving on to other things. In terms of the classwork, uh, after they picked the actions, they asked the kids to self-select which action group. So they picked three main action groups, a goose paper group, a great gulp group and a waste management group and there was no limit on which action you could line up for so the it looked like the great gulp group was the most popular and she made sure anybody who wanted to do that could do that as well as the goose or the waste management then they would start with one action so the first one they did was to have a poster and so then she gave them examples and modeled and showed them what was possible and then because the meetings were every two weeks the students would have chance to work to start their poster during the meeting but then they had the rest of the two weeks to work on their poster and submit an image of it on google classroom before the next one uh, she said sometimes it was rushed helping trying to help 50 people all at once and all the questions but it was great with the two uh, staff members on side um, she, this is great she was able to show uh, us uh, pictures of, of some of the things that the kids did and the best part was that these were home actions so these posters were were shown at home um, again, depending on the grade level, you've got different levels of expertise or depth, of course, teaching and giving opportunities to research what the issues were, um, you know, uh, loving this, use reusable water, stop wasting water, comic strips. And I love this one, putting different languages. One family had multi-lingual speakers in the home, so they wanted to make sure that everybody understood the message. And so they got help. They were using Pixton and Google Translate to make sure that the message was um, received well from all family members. And here again, more. And even this one, you know, know your waste and, and how to organize it. So lots of great work uh, just from the first one. Now, the second step was then to track the, the actions over time, where in fact, the people at home changing their behaviors. 
because we know that facts don't change behaviors. <laughs> so we need practice to change behaviors. And so they put the, they encourage the students to put the tracking sheet in a visible place and just to check mark each week how they did, how they felt they did. And she said it was great when these tracking sheets came back to see all the actions that were done at home and just sort of the, the increase of, uh, in a sense, compliance at the end of the time. I'm sure uh, the parents were nagged into it as, as we do this so well. <laughs> um, the next action, uh, Soraya said she talked to the kids about, well, this is great, we're doing it at home, but how can we make a bigger action? And so they talked about all the different possibilities. And when they talked about reaching out to the Premier Doug Ford, the kids really got excited. So she took that as a clue that they would then come up with a letter writing campaign. This one took a little bit longer because they did some research and I thought this was great. She curated some resources, put them on a slide, allowed the students to do the research at age appropriate levels. And then over the next uh, two, three meetings, they came together, they worked in breakout groups. She supplied the first paragraph and then in small groups of threes and fours, they came together and wrote the second paragraph. So all in all, they created nine letters that were written to Doug Ford. Um, unfortunately, uh, Mr. Doug Ford, Premier Doug Ford, did not respond. Uh, so I think they should send the letters again. But the kids were so pumped when they saw the letters being mailed out. And Sarai did that then from home with a little bit of editing just to make sure they were in good shape. Um, the next part is she just wanted to let you know that organizing the group does take a little bit of pre-thought and to make sure that maybe you can use your Google Classroom or again, the two people to keep track of who you're talking to, who you've connected with, any issues, the attendance, um, so that you're keeping track of the impact as well as uh, who you're connecting with, just to make sure that if someone is falling through the cracks, you're reaching out and making sure that they're part of a uh, part of the team or that they feel welcome. Um, in terms of impact, um, they, they found that they were likely the only extracurricular <laughs> run in that large group of, um, I don't know about you, but I wasn't able to run any extracurriculars in my virtual class. Um, but they, I'm just so impressed at what they did. So when the principal found out, they asked them to write a, a newsletter in the LC4 or LC3 newsletter. They did that. And so they talked about what they did. They were able to get and complete their certification from Eagle Schools Canada. So they shared the seal widely, not only with the students, but with the parents and again, with all the administrators. They also, uh, Eco Schools Canada also sent a certification or certificate, sorry, of work, which then she then made a copy for each of the students, put their name on it and connected it with um, the parents. So at this point, I asked her sort of what were the benefits and the, and the challenges of doing this virtual group? Was it worth it? And she said the benefits for the students were being able to connect with each other from all across the area and realize there were like minded people like them. Uh, they met new friends that was exciting and fun. They had some time for breakout social hours as well as the icebreakers and also giving the kids um, an opportunity to go beyond the school day and kind of make school normal in a way that it was when it, they were back in the class. And as we know that some of the kids were alone for a long time, so being able to connect in a fun way was also so important. Uh, for her, she said it was, and for Michelle, of course, seeing their passion and then igniting that passion in students. And then as the students got excited, that reciprocal passion back and forth. And of course, the success, breeding success. And they just got so excited about the impact that they were having. And then Michelle was a brand new teacher. So being able to be mentored by Soraya and feeling like she could do this on her own um, another year or bring on another, again, that ripple effect of, again bringing more people into the community challenges as with 2000 kids you can't or 20000 kids you can't take everyone and so she felt like she let some parents down um, and she had wished that there were more staff she would have been able to work with to offer this opportunity to more of the kids um, but also just acknowledging her own mental wellness 
it was tiring at the end of the day and Zoom fatigue was a real uh, and true uh, challenge for her. But um, if you know her, she is an eco hero and a superhero at that. And uh, so she really puts out the challenge to all of us. We don't have to do a lot, but doing what we can with what we have, small actions do make a difference in the lives of our, of our students that we teach. And it makes a, lot, a difference in our life as well. So I think she passes on the gauntlet. Uh, and she said she also got a pair of green Converse sneakers to go with her outfit. So that was really important. All right, back to you, Farah. Wonderful. Thank you so very much, Pam. Uh, thank you for sharing all of those amazing ideas. I love that they're so doable, things that um, we can take back into our own homes. I love as well the example of um, translating this as well to involve your parents and the whole community, really. Thank you for sharing. Next, we're going to hear from three amazing student representatives at Earl from Earl Egg Secondary School. Erica, Julie, and Leah will be speaking about the eco initiatives that their eco council ran last year, despite the pandemic. Welcome, Erica, Julie, and Leah. Thank you for introducing us, and we're so excited to be here today. So hi, my name is Erica, and I'm this year's eco president. I'm Julie, and I'm this year's vice president. My name is Leah, and I'm the eco literacy executive this year. And today we're so excited to share what we've accomplished last year, and we hope to give you many new ideas for your future eco initiatives. So last year we put a heavy emphasis on using social media because it allowed us to engage with the student body while overcoming many COVID-19 restrictions. One of our most successful campaigns was the National Sweater Day campaign, where we got most of the clubs and councils in our Hague to wear their favorite sweaters and to write an environmental pledge on a sweater template. Afterwards, we took photos of them and posted them on our Instagram page. So coming up with these pledges inspired the members of those councils to implement a more eco-conscious mindset into their daily lives, while posting them on social media allowed us to spread those ideas. We also posted a video on our student government's Instagram page with over 1,500 followers, which really furthered our student engagement. But most importantly, this was one of our most enjoyable actions because this was actually the first time we got to work together as a council to create an environmental change in Earl Haig. So even though social media is most known for campaigning, it can also serve as a method of taking surveys. When we were halfway through quadmester two, all TDSB schools went virtual. This was an issue for actions such as turn off for electronics and anti-idling because we could not directly, directly monitor our students. To overcome that, we posted some surveys on our Instagram page to gather information on the habit of our students. And through these surveys, we were able to monitor the efficacy of our initiatives. A good example of how we use these surveys was through the make turn off your electronics action. Usually we would have announcements reminding staff and students to turn off their computer monitors, lights and other electronic devices before and after school. When we went virtual, we first posted these Instagram polls to see if people were really minimizing their energy consumption. Then we started sending reminders to all staff and students through email. And afterwards, we posted the poll again to see if students reduced their energy consumption. And overall, we're happy to say that students started turning off the electronics more often. But as useful as social media is, it has its hard limits. As we all know, not everyone has or uses Instagram or social media for that matter. Therefore, campaigns only reach a part of the student body and surveys only represent a select group of students. So as we move forward into this, this new school year, social media should be treated as a secondary tool of engagement rather than a primary tool. And it should be used to help support your eco initiatives rather than to as a primary tool of engagement. With that said, I will now pass it off to Julie who will be talking about Earl Haig's target climate change event and how impactful such an event can be to your community. 
Thank you, Erica. So the Eco Council at Earl Haig is made up of students who deeply care about the environment and who want to help fight climate change, as it is the biggest environmental issue we currently face. While we place great importance on the initiatives we do at school, like those that Erica mentioned, we also realize that in the grand scheme of things, the impact of these actions is unfortunately quite minimal. This is one of the reasons we decided to teach the student body at our school about the environment because the whole student body of 2000 kids working together has more impact than just the 20 core members of the Eco Council. While we reached Earl Hague students through our social media campaigns and the 30 minute presentations we do for the junior students, last year we realized we could expand our reach even further to the Willowdale community as well. During the pandemic, we found that many students and community members were feeling hopeless about the actions we could take to fight climate change. Inspired by Cumber Valley Middle School, we are therefore planning to hold a Target Climate Willowdale event on Zoom next month to help our community work together to help the environment. This meeting will be a place for students from both Earl Haig and other schools in Willowdale to inspire each other by sharing the actions they have been taking. Students will also be able to have discussions with our political representatives and learn from our guest speakers representing various facets of environmental action, from urban planning to environmental law. We are inviting many nonprofits like Fridays for Future and NeighborLink North York to encourage students to find other ways to get involved in fighting climate, the climate crisis as well. The community members in Willowdale are very vocal about the environment, and by providing them with a platform to learn about how we can create positive change, we believe that we can work together to make our neighborhood more environmentally conscious. Furthermore, we hope the meeting shows our political representatives at all three levels of government that the environment is an issue we all care about, and as future voters, we want them to voice our concern about climate change in their policy planning sessions. If you would like to join us for our Target Climate Willowdale meeting, please come on November 25th. Leah will be posting a link to the invite, invite, event right in the chat for it shortly. Earl Lake Eco Council believes that there are many ways we can help the environment and from the smallest initiatives to discussing larger issues with our parliamentary representatives, there is room for advocacy and action at every level and we are determined to do our best to make the greatest positive impact that we can. While our Target Climate Willowdale meeting is about having open discussions with our leaders and community members, we have also spoken directly with Toronto City Council about our complaints of what we believe needs to be fixed in our city. I will now pass it over to Leah, who will talk about her deputation to the Toronto Budgeting Committee. Thank you. Thanks, Julie. Last year, I became Eco, -Literacy, Eco Council's Literacy Executive. It was a bizarre year to take on such a responsibility. Due to the pandemic, the Eco Council could not run our ordinary activities, and this limitation forced us to focus on creative alternatives. We began to reach out to local politicians to lobby for environmental issues. As part of my role, I delivered a deputation before City Council, urging them to recommit to reducing city waste 70% by 2026, as outlined in Toronto's long-term waste management strategy. In my speech, I referred to City Council's previous budgeting promises and the $2.5 million they were not spending on a climate plan. I reminded the budgeting committee that these long-term goals are only five years away. Action is becoming urgent. This whole experience was exhilarating. The deputation was a success. We will be participating in the city budget deputation again this year. This event inspired Eco Council's further participation in political discussion. This year, during the federal election campaign, Erica and I interviewed candidates in our school's writing. We asked each party about their plans to transition to green energy and reduce fossil fuels. The interview was live streamed and members of our community tuned in to hear each party promote their platform and respond to our questions. Becoming involved in political discourse has made Eco Council stronger. It inspired Earl Haig students and clubs to engage in political discussion. I would not have delivered a deputation or interviewed members of parliament of my own accord, but the more I participated and learned, the more I felt part of a community and the less afraid I became. So I think Erica's going to open up some room for questions now. Yeah, if you guys have any questions on how we went about these initiatives, 
please feel, to, feel free to drop a question in the chat and we'll be happy to answer any questions you all have. So there is a question from uh, Hillary. What advice would the Earl Hague team give other students wanting to begin similar initiatives? Um, I guess I can take this. Um, so I think the best place for all of us to start is on the Eco Schools platform. That's where we began to. And um, there's a lot of different initiatives that you can choose from on there. And we use those as guidelines. And from there, brainstorming with your eco team to come up with um, new ideas to build upon those initiatives already provided is a great way to start. Um, and that's how most of these initiatives came up to begin with. Wonderful. And how can we as teachers best support you in your amazing work? So um, this year, eco has a staff supervisor. His name is, his name is Mr. Prasad. And he is a really knowledgeable person who knows a lot about gardening and soil chemistry, actually. So if you're a teacher who knows a lot about environmental sciences or are just even interested in helping your students, that's already a great place to start. And as a staff, reaching out to students and getting them engaged can really help give people that push to start looking into Eco Schools Canada and to start making their own initiatives. So being passionate and maybe doing a lot, of, a lot of research and having lots of knowledge on environmental topics would really help students as through whether they're in high school, elementary school, kindergarten or middle school. That's wonderful. Thank you for sharing. And we have um, some more questions here. Um, Maha's asking, during the pandemic, what kept you motivated to keep making a difference? Um, I guess I can take this again, but one of the Thank things you. that did motivate me was talking to other people. Um, during the pandemic, I was mostly just alone in my room, but like eco council meetings and just reaching out to my friends to have discussions was a lot more helpful because if we had the same or similar ideas, then we could bounce other ideas off each other to get inspired to do things. Um, for example, like a lot of us would send petitions around or even have conversations about like relevant political stuff that was going on in the um, concerning the environment just so that we could all feel like there was something we could do together even though it was all virtual of course so i think just having like open channels of communication between like-minded individuals was a really big help to me thank you julian um we're also very impressed by all of your actions and all of your work. A couple more questions from Kara. How frequently did you meet and what did you find works the best for your team? How do you work in teams under those major areas that you presented? Um, so I can speak on this. So last year we had meetings every week, except for holidays, of course. And what helped us um, explore these different divisions of environmental advocacy was that we had a lot of executives. So we were able to split the work among many people. So none of us were really overwhelmed at one point in time, because as you know, we're all high school students and it was a really hectic year last year. So yes. having a lot of executive members would be really great. And last year we had a lot of people who were really knowledgeable in what they did. For example, Julie and Leah knew a lot about politics, so they were really engaged on that end, while others knew more about, you know, food waste management and saving endangered species. So everyone knew something and everyone could contribute something. So everyone was really pulling their own way in the Eco Council, and this showed through our meetings because everyone was bouncing ideas off each other. So we were able to come up with many initiatives to run throughout the school year that were one, created an environmental impact and two were something that we were actually really passionate about. So that's also what really motivated us and helped us throughout the school year. That's amazing. Thank you. You definitely made an incredible impact. It's so impressive. Erica, Julie, and Leah, truly you are eco heroes. Thank you for sharing all that you've done. Um, I love how you included your peers and collaborated with other clubs and councils as well. Clearly, you are all passionate about the environment and creating positive change. And as Hillary mentioned, hopefully you'll be OISE students one day. And uh, keep inspiring, keep up the amazing work. Thank you so much.
Next, we'll hear from our final guest speaker, Linda Nacarado. Linda is from the Sustainability Office and a member of the Eco Schools team. She will be presenting the TDSB's recent Climate Action Report and the board's um, current environmental initiatives and plans for the future. I'll tell you that I got to hear Linda speak last week at the TDSB Eco Schools kickoff, and what she has to share is informative, exciting, and amazing. Welcome, Linda. Thank you. Thanks for that. All right, so I'll get right to it. I mean, it's a very tough act to follow. <laughs> um, the Earl Haig Eco Council is pretty amazing, but hopefully we can inspire you with uh, these actions at the board level. So I'm going to be presenting on the annual report um, from this year on climate action. It is hot off the press, um, just was uh, approved by the board. Uh, Hi. 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 <laughs> oh, I think we've got some, some uh, friends on the line. Um, it just was approved on the board uh, for, um, on October 20th. And to give you a little bit of context about this, the um, Board of Trustees first endorsed back in 2019 the City of Toronto's Climate Emergency Declaration. And coming from that, in spring of 2020, a staff report went to trustees outlining those planned actions to address climate change. And the really big takeaway from that was the formation of a new energy and climate action technical team. And that would help to address ways that the board could look at reducing their greenhouse gas emissions. In, and then the last piece here is the culmination, which is this new report, which addresses some of those actions and outlines the step forward. And this quote is featured in the report, and I think it's pretty important because it outlines that students currently feel like we're not doing enough. And what that leads to is a real feeling of hopelessness, fear, of anxiety, and so it's important that as a board, we show that we're doing more and that we are changing our efforts. So how are we responding to this climate crisis? Well, we have to look at how we are gonna be investing not only in what is taught, what happens in our classrooms, but also the infrastructure of the board. So how are buildings operated? And what are the ways that we design and maintain our school grounds? And traditionally, we've been really good at this. In the classroom has been our strength. And that's so evident by all of you here today, um, by amazing initiatives and our partnerships with OISE around professional learning, our environmental additional qualifications. We've done a lot around climate change education and action in the classroom. What we're looking to do now is balance that at a board level because we understand that individual action is amazing, but it needs to be balanced with system level change. And so what are the operational changes we can make as a board and the investments that we can make to really address climate change? So this report takes a look at um, the actions that will be taken specifically in six key areas. And there are 22 actions that are outlined in this report. I'm not going to go through all of those, but I really encourage you, um, especially if you're interested in a key area, to take a look at the report and read through those actions. Um, I'll highlight just one specific action from each of them today. But what's really important to note is that when creating this report, we thought about actions that were meaningful and achievable. The idea being that this is an annual report. So next year we'll report back to board and be able to talk about the progress that's been made on these specific actions. Okay, so the first section here around climate change education and engagement. Um, this is all about facilitating youth-led community climate action projects. Um, much like the ones that are happening already at Earl Haig, we want to encourage more initiatives like this and youth to get involved. And so part of our work is to promote and to, to kick off our Youth Climate Action Guide that will be launching later this fall um, to, to help build out strategies on how to engage your communities around climate action. And partnering with that, we've got um, work with the city to help facilitate city grants so that these actions um, can become a reality. All right, the next section is all about buildings. And the example action here is establishing better supports for caretakers to efficiently operate buildings. I've pulled up for you this chart, which shows you the TDSB emissions totals. And I think it's really important to recognize that while we talk a lot about things like 
electric vehicles, about electricity use, a major, major part of our emissions actually comes from natural gas, which is primarily the heating of our buildings. And I'm sure as educators, maybe even as students, you've been just sweating in a classroom in December or January, cranking open the windows because the classrooms felt too hot. So how do we address that so that we can operate our buildings smarter, so that we can be more efficient, and that we can support caretakers so that we can really cut down on these greenhouse gas emissions. So that includes training, report cards from our buildings and administrative sites so we can see what their energy use is like and target ones that are really heavy emitters and implement more building automation systems. All right, transportation, this is very exciting. Our example action is that we are starting to, to begin this transition from our electric or from our vehicle fleet, currently gas powered to electric. And so this looks at a broad range of things. It's investments in electric vehicles, but it's also creating um, the infrastructure for charging stations in the future and training for our T2SB mechanics so that they'll be able to work on electric vehicles. When we look at urban forest, this is an area that already the TDSB has done a lot of investment in. We are signaling, though, the doubling of the amount of trees that are planted annually in the TDSB's large tree planting program. And specifically, we are looking at this from the direction of strategic planned planting. How do we plan our planting so that it's really addressing climate change and responsive planting, which means um, being responsive to changes in our environment, like diseases that might impact trees. And I think it's really incredible how we'll be selecting the locations for these um, trees in the future. Again, it's based on need and climate change mitigation. So looking at canopy coverage, our learning opportunities index, the proximity to major arterial roads and highways, which gives us a good indication of particulate matter in the air, and heat vulnerability. And we get this information from sources like the Toronto Public Health, heat advisory um, uh, maps and all their resources. Okay, when it comes to communications, um, the TDSB admittedly has not been the best at sharing loudly the great successes we've had in the past and our environmental initiatives. So we wanna change that. We have just launched a new website, a new environment, energy and climate action site. And this helps to share those stories more broadly, to help illustrate, you know, the past 20 years of environmental initiatives that have happened at the board and where we're heading next. And lastly, um, the Environmental Legacy Fund is another key area outlined in this report. And it's key because it's um, a major funder of a lot of our environmental initiatives. If you don't know anything about the fund, it was created back in 2010 as part of the first climate action report that the board had. And revenues include the sale from carbon credits, from our, the electricity that's generated from the TDSB owned solar roofs, and also the sale of e-waste. And maybe you have received actually um, funds through the uh, Environmental Legacy Fund by participating in environmental AQ um, subsidies or even the conferences like the one that's coming up on November 6th in partnership with OISE. These are all initiatives that we're able to provide because of the Environmental Legacy Fund. And our action here is really changing the terms of reference to include new sources of revenue, because if we're going to do more as a board, we need to increase the revenues in this fund so that we can actually um, we can fund it. And so the, the big action here is directing utility incentives and rebates back into the fund. All right. And. This whole session, I think, has been really inspiring. Um, I know it can be very um, bleak to sometimes talk about climate change. We really want to highlight telling a different story, telling and sharing some of our positive um, impacts and wins. So did you know, did you know that while you were off maybe learning remotely or teaching remotely, that in 2020 and 2021, the TDSB replaced over 800 drinking fountains with water bottle filling stations? And so this happened at close to 500 uh, schools across the board, and it's helping to bring us up to a standard of one water bottle filling station for every 250 students. Did you know? Did you know that the TDSB actually began investing 
in renewable energy back in 2010. And our focus was on solar powered roofs or solar rooftops. And we actually have now close to 350 or over 350 schools and administrative sites that have solar panels on their roofs. On our new site, you can check out where those schools are at, what's their energy capacity, their energy generation, and even calculate their carbon offset. And lastly, did you know that the TDSB actually has a sawmill? So this is located in the west end of the city at one of our administrative sites, and it's a way that we repurpose the trees from that it might have fallen or been diseased from TDSB sites, but also from the city. And these trees are repurposed into log benches that you might have on your uh, school grounds and in outdoor learning classrooms. It's also sometimes the wood that's used in our technical programs for students. So it's a really great example of taking something negative and finding creative ways to reuse that resource. And you can learn more about these environmental actions on our website. We have a great timeline going all the way back to 2000 to see the actions that the board has taken and hopefully give you some inspiration for the future. So thank you very much. Thank you, Linda. Absolutely inspiring. And thank you for sharing all that information. Um, I was taking a lot of notes as you shared. The 22 actions are really meaningful, as you mentioned, and definitely doable. I love that uh, the report includes engaging our youth in climate action projects. So thank you for reminding us about that and also to tell a different story, as you say, when it comes to climate action. So we're focusing more on the hope. So thank you for that. We do have some questions and comments um, in the chat. And um, sorry, I'm just, one person was wondering, how are the initiatives being shared beyond the TDSB? Sure. So um, right now, we're, we the report has just come out. So we are definitely promoting with um, with our, our community first. So um, sharing through social media, sharing on our website. Um, we're also part of um, city initiatives. So we're, we partner with the city on quite a few different initiatives. Um, and so we uh, definitely are, are connecting with them. We really encourage, so I think, I think if people are reading the report and getting excited about it, to share it widely, share it with your own communities and, and kind of get excited about some of the initiatives. And I know Pam and Richard, also from the sustainability officer here too, is there anything else you'd want to share? I, I was going to hope that Richard was there and maybe could speak to it, but um, Linda, I want to introduce you to Mika Foster. Um, Mika had worked with our Eco Schools team and we miss her greatly because she changed the face of waste um, in our schools in terms of waste audits and making sure that we were being responsible. Uh, I met her uh, and I got some vermi, uh, red wigglers from Mika the very first time I met her. Um, and uh, she has been an inspiration uh, since then. Um, but Richard, perhaps we could uh, call on you to answer, how, how can we share this more broadly? No, I'm, I'm not sure I can add anything to what Linda said. I mean, to be honest with you, I think, um, you know, our, our challenge right now, it's one thing to present this report, get it approved um, and outline the 22 actions. But of course we have to be successful implementing them. So I think that's really, you know, as some, some people on our team say, you know, our heads are down, our heads are down kind of implementing what's in the report. And I think also looking ahead to what will be in next year's report, as Linda said, like this is really meant to be meaningful, doable, you know, what can we do in the shorter term over the six, next six months, next, over the next year, but really already as we implement those actions, looking ahead to, well, okay, what's the next step? What are we going to do next year? Um, so, you know, I don't think a huge, we don't put a huge um, emphasis on broadcasting it widely other than it's on our public website and social media. So hopefully people will pass it, pass it along, along, but our, you know, our emphasis really isn't on, communicating it broadly it's, it's trying to get the job done and show what's possible for so for example as Linda said like the electric vehicles like that's fantastic like yeah you, you, like I would be very surprised if there's a single school board in Canada that will have any electric vehicles in their fleet this year you know we will so it's really leading by example showing that we can do these things 
and um, and hopefully people will, um, you know, other school boards, other schools across the country will uh, follow suit. That's wonderful. Thank you. And, and that basically addresses one of the questions as well about sharing this with city councillors. Um, there is also a suggestion to share it with TDSB Connects, a newsletter that goes out to parents and students. Um, there's another question in the chat. Can schools apply to have solar panels installed or for trees? Okay, good question. Yes. <laughs> okay. I think what I would say, so starting with solar, first of all, what I, what I would suggest that you do is check the website that Linda told you about, our, our public website, and just check the list because we've had many cases where people will say, well, we should get solar panels for our schools, for our school. And it actually, they have solar panels on their school. So as Linda said, like 350 of our schools have solar panels and most of those schools, the roofs are full. So I would check our website first to make sure you don't already have them. And I think what I would say is I think in terms of more solar projects, you know, I think down the road, you know, we likely will do more, but I think our, as Linda showed the graph, right? Like the green, our greenhouse gas emissions are not from electricity, right? Our greenhouse gas emissions are from the natural gas that we use to heat our buildings. So that's why in the building section, I think there's eight actions in the building section. A lot of them are really trying to get at our use of natural gas in our buildings because that's where the heavy lifting on the emissions is, is. We put we put a lot of effort into solar and it's all great, you know, it's really good. But um, but the work really needs to be the focus. I think needs to be on natural gas for us in the in the near future for sure. Thank you. Richard. And I think in terms of trees, I, I guess what I would say is you can always reach out to Linda, Pam, or me about trees. Um, what we are trying to make, we have been trying to help schools that want to plant trees and just trying to help as many as we can. But I think one of the shifts we're trying to make in addition to doubling our large tree program, our planting program, is to um, take two thirds of the plantings that we do and be really strategic about it. So it's not really about, you know, who comes forward to say, you know, I'd like trees. It's more about identifying, you know, where are the schools in the city that have a lot like high heat vulnerability that are hot because they're, they don't have parks. They don't have a lot of trees, you know, they have a lot of hard surfaces. So just try to understand like, where are the schools, not necessarily that are asking for the trees, but where are the schools, they might not be asking, but they really need trees, right? And so we really want to shift our focus to two thirds of the plantings to really be targeted at those schools where they're really needed. Like another example, as Linda said, by highways, with the particulates coming off the highways, we have schools right along the highway. So we really feel we need to be doing major planting at schools along the highways, for example. Um, but again, about a third of the, a third of the uh, plantings will still be responsive, which really means that, you know, a school may not be on our priority list, but we will still try to help them if they really want trees. Excellent point. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, thinking of the amazing work that students and teachers have just been sharing, would it be possible for the TDSB Environment website to have a page in which stories of student and teacher actions could be shared with each other? I love that idea. I think that's yeah. that's great. Yeah, yeah. We're still, we, we sort of have um, created this, the framework with this new website. Um, but I think we would love to think about ways that we can use it to kind of amplify those stories um, and share them them widely. So yes, and absolutely. I, and if I could just add to that, the TDSB has, has got an idea of the uh, Google Connects and Google Communities. And uh, now that I'm not teaching grade eights, I hope to increase that <laughs> and get some more stories out because you're right. And it's uh, one story inspires another story, inspires another story. And, and the clips, well, we've got the recorded webinars, but yeah, how do we get that message out? But without inundating uh, people's emails, that can be yeah challenging. And I think okay. actually for us, Sunday Harrison had an idea yes. about the, if you want to address that one, yes. Richard might be able to. Yeah. Sure. Sunday Harrison was just asking, will TDSB make space for its own tree nursery? Because this would allow for students planting from seed, biodiversity, plus considering climate change in trees. Okay. Okay. Sunday. Great, great idea. Yeah. So I think what I would say is, is that um, 
you know, it's kind of like what I said about, you know, we've just got this report approved and our heads are down implementing the 22 actions. But we, at the same time, we are looking ahead to what are we not doing that we should be doing? So Sunday, whether you or if anybody has a specific proposal, uh, I'd be very happy to hear a specific proposal. Like, I, I don't think it's something we have limited staff and limited time. And, you know, we can't, there's a lot of things we can't just get to, but we're, we, you know, we are very interested in partnering. And I think especially, you know, Linda shared the news that we got approval to direct the utility rebates and incentives into the environmental legacy fund. And I, I will say that's huge. Like that's huge. Like through the energy retrofits we're doing at the board this year, we believe we're going to earn over six hundred thousand dollars in utility incentives. So, so we are, you know, long story short, we are interested in any proposals that Sunday or others may have, whether it's about, you know, trees or whether it's about something else we're not doing that we should be considering. Wonderful. Thank you. And just being mindful of the time as we wrap up this webinar, thank you so very much to the sustainability team and to everyone who presented and to all of you who joined us today. Um, we're just going to pull up some upcoming events to share with you. Just before we go, we wanted to let you know about some uh, that, oh, sorry, I just see a feedback poll pop up. There are some upcoming events. Just a reminder about our conference coming up on November 6th, the Climate Courage Educators Addressing the Climate Crises. Um, please make sure you look for that on Eventbrite, as shared earlier. And we have a webinar on November 18th, Teaching Climate Change by Actively Empowering Learners in a Warming World. And on November 23rd, Sustainable Happiness and Wellbeing. We hope that you can join us. And as Hillary mentioned, um, there is a link for past webinars that you can view at your own leisure. Next slide, please. So there's even more to come this fall. Um, please do check out TDSB Eco Schools and the OISE ESC websites. You can follow them on social media on Twitter and Instagram by searching Eco Schools TDSB for TDSB Eco Schools and at OISE ESE on Facebook and Twitter for uh, the OISE ESE initiative and on Instagram at Learn OISE ESE. So we thank you all for joining us today and please do fill out the exit poll before you leave just to let us give to give us some feedback about whether this webinar met your learning needs. So if you can kindly complete that, that would be appreciated. And thanks once again for joining us and we hope to see you again soon. Have a good evening. Bye.